Pamela Van Rijn. He is the chief investment officer at Rebecca Asia, the company managing $20 billion in Asian equities. What a, ra a ramp up we've had so far this year, Arno. I mean, have you been able to share that? This is one part of my question. And where do we go from here? We've gone yeah. too far too fast. Well, I've considered myself to be a nervous bull uh, for uh, the last part of uh, 2011, also for the first part of 2012. A nervous bull thinking, to charge, don't they? Well, <laughs> <laughs> thinking we're at the bottom of a trading range right now, and there was room to rally 15% or so. So we still have 5 maybe 10% left, and then we'll really have to see, because, of course, the problems luring in the background are still there. They're um, still there, Arne, that's for sure. But uh, let me put it to you this way, and it is that this time last year, those problems were not priced in. Are they priced in now? I would say they largely are in Asia, but the main thing for Asia is whether fund flows are returning. And that's, of course, that's been driving the rally in the last couple of weeks, that fund flows are really returning from the West into the East. And maybe that's a bit too far too fast. Because what you see in an environment where banks are repatriating capital is that fund flow is drawn, being drawn away from Asia. And that's been a really yeah, a bad I mean, news for the Asian markets in the last half of 2011. Exactly. As, uh, banks have been showing up their balance sheets uh, in Europe. And you're saying that the money's coming back now. Well, that's what you see in the numbers, right? Flows are returning with a vengeance in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, yeah, that really sets the stage for a powerful rally. And if that were to continue into the next year, which, yeah, there, there is all the fundamental reasons for that, with Asian economies being relatively strong, then, of course, markets could break into new bull market territory. But for the time being, I'm saying we're in range trading with 5 to 10 percent upside. And from there, we really need to see how things shape up uh, in Europe. I mean, even, you know, you say maybe another 5, 10 percent to go on this. Uh, what uh, does that mean in terms of valuations? How does that change the game? Our valuations truly are very cheap throughout Asia. So that's not really the issue because earnings have come through. Uh, well in line with expectations and you see with companies like Samsung you know, still beating expectations so some of the bellwethers here are still yeah, doing very well, very well. We're talking about uh, Asian equities on average uh, what uh, 10 11 times the forward earnings? Yeah that's right yeah well it depends on whether you include Japan yeah. which is historically of course very very cheap on yeah. cash flow basis but uh, the rest of Asia trades just above 10 times earnings yeah, and yeah that, that historically is a cheap level. Okay, I mean, you know, we've got that, all this buzz at the moment and the noise uh, coming out of Europe remaining very, very, at the moment, disparate and actually uh, uncertain as to what goes on there, what happens with the debt crisis. But uh, the mood in uh, the U.S. seems to be changing. People thought that it would be temporary, but, uh, you know, news from Caterpillar and some of the corporates, very positive on the U.S., and that must be uh, making itself felt here. Yeah, but don't forget, we're sort of in a sweet spot, right? If Bernanke is talking about another round of quantitative easing, that's fine, but it also shows you something about the underlying strength of the economy not being all that, yeah, uh, what we make it out to be. Well, so what, what I'm looking for really is also what the news is going to be from China, right? Because that's been the main worry here in Asia, whether China is going to achieve that soft landing. And here I would also say it's sort of better to travel than to arrive. For the next couple of months, we can fantasize about how quickly they will ease. And uh, by the end of March, we'll probably know what the next leadership is going to look like. And then that's the part, point where we arrive. So I'd say you have two more months of window where markets can rally. And then we really need to see it's a make or break situation. Okay. Well, uh, GDP number out of the U.S. a bit later on. How closely will you be watching that? Well, I don't care. It's history. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. It's, it's in the past, but it might tell us something about where, you know, if you break it down, whether there is actually firm momentum. Well, I'd say, yeah, that indeed the, the things to watch are their uh, investments in housing and things like that. If they start to recover, then, yeah, that's where it, where it all started, right? And that's where the recovery should also begin. Yeah, yeah you, you, you mentioned uh, Fed verbally, actually, uh, saying that there could be QE3, but there's verbal quantitative easing taking place in, in a way right now, as people anticipate it. But if one has a look at what QE does and what it has done, how do you think it should be reformed the next round of it? It would be different, wouldn't it? Every time it's different, yeah. I can't tell you very much about that, I would say. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's making money available for the markets and that's fine for them. Right? Arno, very quickly, uh, 20 seconds, where you, are where you invested? We're, we're invested right now in Japan, Korea. Those are clearly the, the, the lead markets where valuations are the most attractive. And we, are, uh, yeah, we've, we have warmed up to China, so and we're looking for additional uh, stock ideas there too because we think that there there's lots of potential for things to surprise on the upside. Anywhere to avoid? Uh, I'd still that India is a, a country that's just gone a little bit too far too fast right now, and there the currency is still at risk, I'd say. Arne, thank you so much for that. Uh, Arne van Rijn van uh, Rebecca.